Hey, Brooke Whipple here, guys. Welcome to my channel. Today, I want to talk about, I want to talk about Alone Season 5. My story. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining me today, guys. Well, this has been a long time coming. I mean, it was just about a year ago I returned from Mongolia after my experience on Alone Season 5. There's just so much to process, so much to talk about, and I've been really waiting and waiting and waiting till I could talk about it. Now's the time. So settle in, get a cup of coffee, get a beverage, because I wanna tell you about my experience, probably a lot of stuff you never saw on the show. First of all, let's talk about right away the stuff I took. I got to take 10 items. First off was a sleeping bag. I chose a down sleeping bag. 40 below bag I knew it was gonna possibly be really cold so a down was good it was gonna be a dry cold environment I took a down bag great choice for me it really kept me warm I was really satisfied it's a marmot quim bag CWM and uh, this is how I keep it stored in the off season and I've used it oh so many times beyond Mongolia I figured I would get rid of this after the show, but no way, this is a great winter bag. And uh, I sleep cold, so a good down bag is a great choice for me. Next thing I took was my bow. I took a Samick Sage takedown bow. Uh, this was my first experience with a recurve. I loved it. I love shooting this bow. I'm just getting it up. Uh, back strung again right now to start practicing for bow season here in Michigan for deer. This is a great bow. It, it, it's take, it, you can take it down and put it in a small package. It was great for traveling to Mongolia. We could only have wooden arrows, traditional type arrows there. Uh, this is one with a field point and uh, had a dozen of those with me. I had uh, some blunt point tips and some broad, broad heads and then this is the case the leather case that I made myself, that went with me to Mongolia. Next thing, of course, is the bow saw. This is exactly the same one I took on season four with Dave. Cannot go wrong with this old fashioned. This is about 23, 24 inches. It's a Baco blade. These are awesome. I mean, I can't say enough good things about just a sturdy old fashioned bow saw, 24 inch blade. Of course, I took the same cook pot as we did on season four. This was an awesome choice. I took trapping wire this time. I took an ax. This is not the ax that I took. I can't find it at the moment. It's around here somewhere. But I took a full size vintage three pound head ax. It was awesome. Uh, of course, I took a ferro rod. They would not let us. Yeah, it's about coyote time. Maisie! 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 <laughs> Uh, they wouldn't let us keep the string on, but uh, I did get to keep my striker, which I was really happy with. So, same ferro rod we had in um, season four. Uh, I also took two and a half pounds of gorp. That was uh, raisins, peanuts, and dark Ghirardelli chocolates. For us, for me, that is the perfect uh, emergency ration. You can have a little bit of salty if you want. You got the sweet. Um, it's just perfect, in my opinion. I would not take anything other than Gorp. The other thing I want to talk about is my Leatherman. Uh, I really fussed about this taking, you know, whether you're going to take a knife or you're going to take a Leatherman. Now, I, I took a Leatherman. Uh, I took my knife, of course, last time on season four of Vancouver. This time I decided to take a Leatherman. And the reason being, it just has so many functional options with it as opposed to just a knife you you have a cutting tool you have a gouge tool you've got a saw i mean and i modified this so i want to show you how i modified it this is a super tool 300 and I, I i definitely was so happy i took this tool so let me show you the mods i made to it uh you open it up First thing you got is just the locking uh, straight edge blade. Next thing you have here are three more tools and this, this were, two of these were modified. Uh, I don't know if you can see it there, hopefully you can. 
This flathead screwdriver, I modified, rounded it off to be a gouge tool, like for spoons and such. This tool here is another flathead screwdriver, and also that was sharpened on both sides before I left. Also, this tool here, the awl, I sharpened that on both sides so that these tools could be used as gouge tools and it worked so well. So let's put those away, show you the other side. And this is a locking blade too, which is really great. On the other side, you have a serrated blade. You gotta be kind of careful pulling this out. You've got your Phillips flathead, another, another small screwdriver, and here again is something I modified. I modified this tool right here, which is the uh, can opener. This was rounded and, sh and sharpened on all sides to be another gouge tool. And that worked really well. I tried to make some cups and, and stuff out there with that. The only problem is now I have to be careful putting it away that I don't cut myself. And of course you also have a saw, which is really nice, a little, nice little saw blade. And uh, I can't show you the other thing I have in here. This tool comes with a file. And what I did before I left is I took that file and I scored it with a Dremel. And when I got out in the field, I broke it off so that I could have a way to sharpen my, my knives, my knife on here. So I broke it off in the field, put a lanyard on it. Actually, I don't know where it is. I'm not sure if I lost it on the way back or since I've been back, but that en enabled me to keep my knife sharpened. I actually had a, I had a file and I just broke it off and used it the whole time I was there. But I absolutely loved this Leatherman. This helped keep me busy. The crafting, the, I mean, you got pliers. You, I mean, you have so many things here to deal with. I did miss my knife. But I was so happy I took this Leatherman because I made so much stuff with it and it just kept me occupied. Mongolia was, uh, it was absolutely amazing. First thing, you know, we had, so much, we had such a good time pre-launch and I know I already posted that video of all of us out there and the pre-launch stuff, which was just really amazing to meet the rest of the cast and hang out and get to know everybody. It was, it was really great. Then comes launch day and Mongolia itself is, uh, re really reminded me of Wyoming mixed with Alaska. So these big open plains and then there's mountains. But they weren't huge. I didn't see any really huge mountains. They're more like ridges and, and um, stunning landscape. Just, it seemed really familiar to me. It felt really, I felt really at home which was really cool. But before we launched, we had to get one more shot and that was the uh, tick-borne encephalitis shot, which is not available in the US, only available in Mongolia. So we got that shot about five days after we arrived in Mongolia on site. I tell you what, that made a lot of us sick. Uh, definitely made me sick for like four or five days. Sick enough, in fact, that the producer was coming around and you know asking some of us, asking me, are you going to be able to do this? Because I had lost all my appetite. I was actually losing weight before we launched. And you know, that's, <laughs> that's about the last thing you want is to start losing weight before you're going to launch on this survival expedition. But uh, you know, diarrhea and, and just feeling nauseous and just not having an appetite at all. It was really a bummer. The bigger bummer was Nicole. As a person with MS, she wasn't even supposed to have this shot, apparently, but nobody knew that. And that's what really caused her flare-up during the show, about a week after we launched, you know. Really affected her in a terrible way. And another, um, right after we got the shot, one of the crew members completely fainted from the shot. Uh, it was a little freaky. So the tick-borne encephalitis uh, turned out to be a, a an awful shot to get there at the last minute, making us sick and ill. But anyway, I recovered enough by the time launch came that, you know, I felt like I could do it, but I had lost weight and just was feeling kind of weak and not into it, you know. It's just hard. But I remember being in the helicopter, you know, they got the cameras rolling on you and they're asking, 
ah, are you excited? You know, what are you feeling? What's going on in your head? And, and uh, it was just a very sobering time. It was a very sobering moment of just, you know, you already know what you're getting into. You know what's going to happen. You've got to get down on the ground. You've got to make things happen like right now. And, you know, the excitement is gone. It's not like the first time you've been on the show where you're like, nah! It's more like, you know, this is going to be the longest Monday going. If, if I could equate it to something, it's like you're going to work on Monday and you know it's going to just going to be a really long week, but you don't know how long that week is going to last. It's going to last, you know, many weeks. And, oh, it's, it's a definitely a sobering thing to get into. And guys, I'm losing daylight here. I gotta go get some lights. <clears throat> All right, guys, I had to move inside. It is just too dark and I've got stuff I wanna show you. So I need the daylight. So anyway, where was I? Uh, talking about getting dropped off. The biggest thing on my mind was shelter. You know, when you're waiting that day of, of launch, you don't know what, you don't know who's getting dropped off first, who's getting dropped off last. It's just random and they don't tell you anything. So you're just waiting your turn. It was a chilly, it was a chilly day. It was spit and rain. They don't let you in any kind of a vehicle. The Unimog was there, that big yellow, you know, all terrain, big vehicle. No, you're, you're, you have to stand out in the weather and wait your turn. It's hours. Plus there's a lot of filming and staging that's going on. You just stand there and you're just cold and you haven't eaten um, since morning. So I think by the, t I was number five getting dropped off. So I feel like it was probably one, it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. So we'd been up since about six getting, you know, all this filming done, launch happens and then you just kind of hurry up and wait for your turn. So it was almost an hour turnaround by the time they pick somebody up and then drop them off and come back to get another person. So it gives you an idea of how far away we are for launching. So you're sitting there wondering like, where are you even gonna go? But you know, you're also waiting your turn because time, time is ticking away. And you know, all I have in my mind is I want a really good shelter tonight, right now. I need to get working on a shelter, so. You know, when they're pointing that camera at you and uh, they're asking you, what are you thinking about? You know, you're trying to survey the land and wonder where you're going, but you know, all I could think about was, I need to work on my shelter, man. Get me there and drop me off. They finally come in for a landing and it's this big, it looked like a wet, big wet, tussocky area. And tussocks are those, they're like clumps of grass, right? And they grow, you know, and they could be like this high off the ground and they're just spaced perfectly. So walking through them is like, think of like a Dr. Seuss book where there's just these big humps of grass everywhere, right? And they're solid. So you either walk between them, put your feet in the holes between them or you walk on top. Anyway, it's just like a broken ankle scenario waiting to happen. So they drop me off in this big plane. I see the river to one side of me. I've got ridges on the other. They kind of give you visuals. They say, hey, don't go farther than this ridge and look over here. You see this where the river comes in over here. Here's a ridge. Those are your boundaries. These are your visual boundaries. And um, good luck. <laughs> Off they go. And they drop your gear. They drop all of your supplies as far as your camera gear. And then um, this year, because the Mongolian government required it, we had to have like firefighting equipment. So we had this bag that we had to fill up with water, like a 10 gallon bag with a, um, with a pump spray. And that was for like emergency fire fighting. If we had like a campfire that got out of control or something. So you've got your backpack gear, you've got your camera gear, which is a big Pelican case. It's about this big with all your gear, which is like four cameras your tripod, blah de blah de blah, you know, memory cards, batteries, etc. They're all in this big pelican case and then you've got your firefighting gear which was required to be on site. So they dropped me off and I immediately know this is not where I want to set up camp. It was just this big kind of open plain area, no place to set up a shelter. It was really open and I look maybe half a mile away is some trees. 
I immediately start to kind of grab my gear and go check that out for a possible place to make a shelter. But in the meantime, uh, you have no water. You're not dropped with water or food or anything. So right away I know if I'm gonna need to get to work, I need water. So I immediately went to the river, grabbed up uh, some water in my pot and made a fire. Now luckily Mongolia was so much more amazing than Vancouver because a, it's a dry climate, but B, they had birch bark there. There was birch trees. So first thing I did, I made a fire so I could boil water, so I could have something to drink while I worked. Really, really important. I was already feeling really parched and dry, so I had to have water right away. Uh, and it was no problem to get a fire quickly because we had birch bark. And then there was this big uh, larch tree there where, where I got dropped off and inside of a cavity there was really dry um, punky you know but very dry wood and uh, it was just no problem to get a fire so immediately had a fire and got to got onto boiling water so you could have something to drink now again you got nothing to drink out of but your pot so then once it boiled then you got to let it cool down because you actually need to put your lips against that and drink out of it so it's going to be a little while for you have water and in the meantime i'm ferrying gear you know, a half a mile or, or three quarters of a mile away to this this area of trees where I can actually set up uh, a shelter. You know, by then it's like you're pushing darkness. And um, the very number one thing that's important to me is shelter. You know, it helps you mentally, it helps you physically stay and feel safe. Um, then you can sleep, then you can feel at home and you can it, shelter means everything to me. Number one, it's my first priority beyond everything else on day one, except for water. I gotta have water and I've gotta get a shelter going. So I got over to this area of trees and I put, uh, I cut one pole and used my uh, trapping wire to tie it to a tree. And then I laid my tarp down like this. And then I got to work cutting some logs to put up in front. So I had, a, so I had front logs and then I had my tarp like this and I slept right in here. So at least the first night I could feel like, you know, I got some walls around me. I didn't want to be open. I don't like being open. Shelter. I just feel vulnerable, especially when you're dealing with an unknown area, unknown situation. Even even the feeling of having a tarp, something completely around you just makes you feel really so much better, so much more secure. So I did that right away. It got very cold that night. Uh, it was very chilly. I would say low 30s right away. So I was very glad to have my down bag. You know, you're just sleeping on the ground. You don't have a ground pad. You do. You haven't had time to, you know, you're really just, you know, it's a very quick situation. You're just making enough something to sleep in for the night. So that's what I did first night and I slept okay. I slept okay. Got up in the morning and you know it's go time. And from there on, you're just acclimating to the land, acclimating to your resources, finding what works, finding what doesn't. Immediately the next few days, I got working on a permanent shelter. And it was right there and that, that location was a good location. It was right near the river. I had a nice uh, rocky sandbar. So I was very close to the river. I would say within 75 feet of the river. And there were some willows and uh, I had larch around me, willows and birch. And it was a very beautiful setting. I, I it was lovely. So right away I got to, um, I got working on a permanent shelter, which was an A-frame, tripod style. You know, I had two sticks going here and then one coming off on each end. And then laying my tarp over, wrapping it around the back and around the front, I had a log wall. I built the indoor fire. So I, I dug way down, about two feet below grade, brought in a bunch of sand. I put laid sand and rock up my log wall in the front. And I dug a tunnel underneath the ground to uh, tunnel in some fresh air for that fire. So really, I was only having like little little stick fires. And it would get fairly smoky in there. I did get it improved. Once I dug that tunnel to give the, the fire air, 
it did draft better. It would it did go up better on my on my tent, and and it made it tolerable in there. So on really bad days when I had to be in my shelter, which I absolutely hated to be, it was tolerable. But that that shelter, that green tarp, really, really was horrible to deal with. Um, you know, season four, we brought white tarps. Now you're dealing with an environment um, in Vancouver where it's so wet, it's so wet. So right off the bat, we wanted to bring extra tarps. Now that green tarp is provided by production and it is to be used for your gear. It's to keep all your cameras dry, all your batteries dry, your memory cards, etc. And if you are using, if you can incorporate that within your shelter and then you're keeping your gear in there, they let you use that for your shelter. So instead of bringing another white tarp, I decided, yeah, I'm just going to use the green tarp that they give you, that they give us. And that way I can choose something else for, you know, gear, which seemed quite logical. But the whole reason we took a white tarp on season four was because of that light diffusion. You know, we wanted the most, the lightest, clearest uh, diffuse light coming down on us possible. We were already going to be in a rainforest environment. And that white tarp giving you this, the clearest, whitest light possible was going to be, a, make a huge difference psychologically and mentally. And that definitely proved true. So on season five, when all I have is a green tarp and I've got this massive green glow. I mean, I didn't even like to film in there because it was just like this green pall, this green glow that just, it sucked the life right out of me. I, I, I literally could not deal with it. Um, and then having a smoky fire, which is just the, the nature of the beast. Oh, I absolutely dreaded being in my shelter. It was just, it was horrible. But I dealt with it. I had a good shelter. On day 11, we had this massive storm come through. The interesting thing about this storm in Mongolia, every night I would have a fire if it was nice. I would have a fire watch the, the sun drop down on the ridge. You could just watch the sun come down and hit those trees until it was gone. And then it would get dark and I'd wait another half an hour around the fire and then I'd go to bed. So I was, that particular night I was really happy to just be done filming. I just wanna go to bed. I just wanna settle in, close my eyes and go to sleep for the night. And I just was hearing this, this noise coming at me. Um, it just seemed like it was a long ways off, just this low rumble, this, 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 I couldn't really place it. You know, it just sounded like this big train, this big, something was coming and the wind was starting to kind of pick up and it, there's just this really uneasy feeling. And pretty soon it's just getting closer and closer and closer. I mean, it kind of gives me goosebumps just thinking about it because it was so unusual. It's not something I'd ever really experienced before. And I thought it's a storm and it's, it's, you can actually hear it coming across the landscape. You can hear that it churning up the land before it hits you. Uh, it was really, yeah, I just, I got goosebumps just reliving that. So when it hit, it, it was just an extreme wind event and thunder and lightning and rain, but it was so intense that it, it just sounded like a freight train coming at you. And it was, I, I, my shelter was good, but I was so, you know, you think about the worst case scenario. It was about nine o'clock at night that at that moment. So here comes this storm what if my shelter doesn't withstand this storm? You've got the whole entire night to deal with this in darkness. If your shelter is going to collapse, if something's going to go kind of catastrophic, you're going to have to deal with this in the dark. It was a very unsettling thought. I, I'm not fond of being alone in the dark. And being in the shelter is my shelter. It makes me feel safe. That's why I'm so adamant about a good shelter. So here comes the storm and I'm literally hanging on to the edge of my shelter going, come on, you can do it. Hang on there. Cause it was just, 
just 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 torrential you know chaos outside and I'm just holding on. I remember I ran the camera for about 45 minutes while that storm was going on. And it would, you kind of feel everything kind of lift up. And But the my shelter did so good. But I just, I didn't want to take my hand off that that one ridge pole. I just, I just wanted to make sure everything would just stay, you know, solid. And I was so relieved when it was over. It just finally passed through and, and, and I knew that my shelter was gonna be fine and I was fine, but oh boy, that was a legitimately scary moment because that storm was so intense. I was hearing big trees falling and luckily I was in an area and I picked it on purpose that there was, I was in just some nice, you know, young trees that had probably, you know, only been growing for 25 years or so just nice and nothing was gonna fall on me so I didn't have that concern it was just hanging on tight you know but seeing the damage the next morning walking around and finding these big trees that had come down hi Roy look at my beautiful kitty oh this is Roy hi baby what you doing that was legitimately uh, legitimately scary moment. Mongolia, for many of the days that we were there, was extremely hot. And they did not portray that on the show, how hot it was. It was unbearably hot at times. I would get as many clothes off as I could. I was wrapping my shemag around me like a skirt. And I, I took my shirt and I had already cut off the sleeves to be used for um, washcloths, you know, and wiping your face off. And so I just had my t-shirt, my cutoff, and my, my shemag. I was walking barefoot. And, and I would just lay on my, I took like this giant sheepskin um, coat with me to Mongolia. And I would bring that out of my shelter and I would lay it on the ground and I would just lay it in the shade of a, a large tree or a birch tree. And as the sun would move, I'd move it and I would just lay there. I couldn't do anything else but lay there and just pass the time because I don't do well in hot weather. And it was so incredibly hot there at times that I couldn't hardly bear it. So I would sit in the shade and I would, I would just do stuff. I would make stuff and I would craft stuff. And I know I, I think I caught, you know, and I try not to read any comments um, online because it can be pretty disheartening because people are not seeing the complete picture of what you're going through and, and they don't know what it's like to endure that much time alone and it's easy to get criticized for making let's say a necklace or jewelry which is exactly what I was doing I was taking my Leatherman and that and and I was making jewelry one day I found and this is one of the baskets I made you know, thank God for the, uh, I thank the Lord for all the birch that was there because I really just love handling birch and, and doing stuff with birch. And the birch bark there kept me so occupied. You know, I was able to make baskets, you know, like this. This is, this is something I made while I was there. And these things are just so handy. You're going out there with absolutely nothing. You, you don't have containers. You don't have stuff to put stuff in. So having birch bark there was a real blessing. So I would make, I, I would go look for birch and I would harvest it. And I would pick just the most beautiful pieces and I would make stuff, okay? And then one day, one day on the beach, um, I found, I found a nest, like a grouse nest on my river beach and, and then the very next day the grouse was gone and all I found was just, you know, a bunch of feathers. And so I gathered absolutely every feather that I could find and I decided I was going to make, make stuff. I would make jewelry. These are these are some earrings that I made. So I would make jewelry with my tie wire. I would do stuff with the with with the pretty feathers. I'm just I'm a huge 
I'm a huge fan of feathers. So I was, I was, uh, I was just constantly doing things while I sat there in the shade. This is, this is a bracelet that I made. This is out of willow with my tie wire. Maisie. I used, I took willow and my tie wire and I made, I made a bracelet like that. You know, it just totally gave me something to do. It, it gives you something to keep you occupied. I've got a box here of goodies that I'm just gonna kind of unload. Um, there was beautiful sage there in Mongolia. So I would just gather it up and I would use willow to tie it up and I would just hang it around my, my camp. The other thing I would do every day, and it was a big deal, is I made I made a birch chain. And this this chain represents every day that that I was there. So every day I would make a new chain. This is made out of a strip of birch. Every day I would make a new birch chain. Just connected, just connected like that. And it really helped just quantify my stay, my days. And I, I would just relish the fact that every day I could make a new chain and that every day this got longer. And it just represented so much accomplishment to me to quantify my days like this get out more stuff here. These are more baskets that I made while I was there. These are some some birch uh, bracelets that I made. This is birch made with uh, also some willow. So I'll put that on. If they fit, you lose so much weight out there. My wrists would get really small. There's my birch bracelet, and these are the bowls. Now this one is just made, you just make these folded over, and then there's these, these little like birch cuffs keeping them. This one has pins, um, just pins keeping the edges together. But I, I, made, I made so many baskets. And I would carry stuff in these all the time. You know, one of these was my fire starting basket. I would have, you know, pieces of birch bark in there. This is actually a little, this is the smallest basket I made, which I just think is so cute. But it's got uh, a piece of the, the grouse egg shell that was in there. Here's another basket I made. And inside here, these are actually owl pellets or eagle pellets, one of the two. Um, when birds of prey eat, they regurgitate all of the bones and the hair matter. And if you took these apart, you would discover what kind of bones, um, what kind of animals they were eating. So I haven't even opened those yet. Here's another basket that I made. So I made so many baskets. Oh, this was cool. Uh, one day around just my, my area around my shelter, I found this. This was pretty cool. So this, this I put on the very top of my shelter and it was kind of like a sentinel. So this is probably um, from a roe deer and those were the type of deer that we had there. But this skull, you know, sat on top of my shelter and I just thought that was so cool. I made a journal while I was there. Now this is a birch bark journal and then I used um, willow to keep it tied shut. And what I did is every day I would write down with charcoal um, what I did that day and how many fish I caught. So on day one it says I moved gear temporary shelter. Day two, build shelter, collected birch bark, found chaga, and there was frost in the morning. Day three, caught first fish, made fire ring outside, made the journal, made a container. Day four, fireplace and shelter, caught second fish, started a daisy chain, and it was hot. 
so uh, you can see what was going on. There's every day it just kind of tells a couple things that I did. Day 26, cold, rain, snow, no fish. And so every day I really loved writing in my journal. Just a little piece of charcoal. Oh yeah, I'm looking through this book here and I forgot that I tried to make a calendar. So I was just I was just guessing at the days, doing like a Sunday, Monday, whatever, and then trying to guess what day it was. Um, it's just, you know, I used charcoal. Because they will not tell you. They don't tell you anything. They don't tell you what day it is, what day of the week it is. Um, it, you got to guess, and that's part of the... It's hard not knowing stuff. And I remember getting out of season four... Um, they wouldn't tell us who won the presidential election. We didn't know if Hillary won or if Trump won, and, and no one would tell us. <laughs> it, it was like four days after we actually were out until we found out, because even after we got out, they wouldn't tell us what was going on. <laughs> anyway, that's a rabbit trail, but yeah, you're always just wondering, what time is it? What day is it? What, what is going on? Anyway, they don't, they don't tell you anything. That's part of the gig. Um, as far as fishing, uh, th they didn't show me fishing, but of course I fished hard every day. And this is one of the fishing rigs that I carved out. This was very similar to what we used on season four. But I carved this out of a green piece of pine from a, that came down in the storm. I just used my axe and chopped away at everything. What I would do is is unwind this and I throw it out this I, I put on a floating line which was just this this piece of wood and then down from the hook about right there so this would float in the eddy and I would I would uh, secure this in a tree and this would just this would just float around in the eddy and I would put a grasshopper on there and it would just float around and I I fished 24-7 with this setup. I had two of these made, so I was, I was fishing two lines at all times. And, and that is the only method that seemed to work for me. I did catch them at first, just by, you know, standing there casting out, but then it just, it just died right out. And so I would just fish 24 seven. I would just go out, check my line, and sometimes I'd have a fish on, sometimes I wouldn't. But, this is what I want to show you. So every time I caught a fish, it was always a big deal for me. I was making a stringer as I went along, and I would carve out one of these. I would carve out a little, a little birch fish, and I would string it up, and that way I could keep track of how many fish I caught. And although you didn't see me fishing, unfortunately, on the show, I was fishing all the time. I was always scouting for new fishing, and I ended up catching 16 fish, and there is my stringer, and I hung that on the outside, and my ridge pole would come out, and it was just getting so decorative out there. I had my, my, uh, my daisy chain going, I had these. I would also just, you know, sit around in that heat, and I would just, I would just make these, you know, mobiles. So these are teeth that I found in the skull, of that, uh, the antlers that I found out, so I, I would string up these, so I strung up the teeth, and then these grouse feathers, you know, and I was just constantly, just constantly doing things, and hanging stuff up, just to keep busy, because if you don't keep busy, uh, your mind just gets the best of you, you know, most of this show, it's you against you, you have to, you have so much going on in your head. You have got nobody to talk to but the camera. You, you're, you're internalizing so much. And you, if you don't just keep yourself busy, it's, it's like you, you'll eat yourself alive. So people that were like, oh, she's making jewelry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was. I was doing anything I could to keep busy. And uh, so thankful for my Leatherman, which helped me do all of these things. 
and uh, the birch bark because you know I've got like eight baskets sitting around here it's just a portion of the stuff that I made with birch I mean I would I would have died to have this much this much stuff to work with in in Vancouver so I was constantly making things I mean I don't even know this is some kind of mobile I, I hung you know I made I found these bones and I was putting dried flowers in the hole here and I was hanging these around my camp because you, you just have to keep busy that's the bottom line oh I remember what this is this was a little I was out on a scouting mission and uh, for fishing because the my river it was so swift in in front of around my camp and it there was no bank it just dropped right off so you're either on the bank or you're in the water there was no in between and the the current was so hard so if you threw your line out it would just go whoosh, go right to the bank and, and be snagged of course you you have 25 hooks you're allowed to to bring and you know losing hooks it just oh it just wears on you so I was always scouting for new eddies. Eddies seemed to be where I would, would catch the fish. So between the ridge and the river, here's this plain. And, and you could go in that and walk that, but it was full of tussocks and it was really difficult to walk through. So I was always looking for new places to fish. Uh, the fishing was frustrating where I was. It seems like some people were having just amazing luck. Uh, they were catching really a lot of fish. And apparently some of us weren't even on the same river. So it's really a luck of the draw where you, where you go, you know. And, and how that's determined is, you, you know, you pull it out of a hat. And I got site number three, same site we had on site in season four. So I was like, yes, because I loved our site in season four. Uh, I had a beautiful sight in season five too, but the fishing was just rough. It was tough. And uh, I didn't find any worms, any grubs. There was nothing to try for bait other than grasshoppers. And it just seemed like after a while, fish just didn't want to bite on it on anything at all. You know, I could see them in there and I couldn't get them. Occasionally you could see them and it was just so frustrating. I even caught some minis, you know, little tiny itty bitty fish put them on a hook and they wouldn't bite those. Um, so, you, you know, it's stuff you don't see on the show. I was just trying and trying and trying, but in the end only caught 16 fish. So yeah, one day I was scouting a new area and I needed some grasshoppers, but I had nothing to put them in. So I just really quick fashioned this little like birch bark envelope and I was catching grasshoppers and stuffing them in this envelope and just hanging on to them because I, I you have nothing else you have to you have to make do so that was this was a grasshopper pouch <laughs> so every time I would catch a fish I, it was just you know it's always amazing uh, <laughs> when when you're successful catching a fish but I'd be like yeah woo, thank you Lord I would go back um, if it was a female, I'd gut it out and there'd be some eggs, some roe, and I would just take those out, eat them raw. I would never let that go to waste. And then take the fish back to camp. Fire there, get a nice little bed of coals, and I'd, I'd lay that fish right on the coals, flip it over once, and it would just be amazing. <laughs> a little salt and butter would have been even better, but it didn't have that. And I'd put that fish, take it out, put it on a rock, say a prayer, thank the Lord for this gift of fish, and oh, dig in, and it was so good. Um, but yeah, they never showed any of that. I don't know why, but it was kind of a bummer. But yeah, I did, I did catch fish, and I was eating um, whatever I could. I didn't find many berries at all, maybe 10 berries. Everything was pretty much, they, they had had a very, very, very dry summer. So there wasn't a lot of stuff growing, you know, that you could find as far as vegetation, at least in my area, there wasn't a um, few, few wild onion bulbs, just, you know, a couple berries here and there. There just wasn't much to eat. One day I was in, you know, around the shelter. 
and I found this rock and here it is looks like this and I'm looking at this rock and I thought that looks like a piece of pizza doesn't it that looks like a piece of pizza and I know a lady in Alaska at the farmers market who I work with she paints rocks so I brought this rock back to her this summer and I said can you make this into a piece of pizza and look what she did for me she turned this rock into a piece of pizza this is the rock that I found by my shelter that to me just looked like a piece of pizza and she turned it into a piece of pizza for me which I think is so cool her name is Ruth Segler she's at the Fairbanks farmers market every summer and I own so many of her rocks so I just thank you so much Ruth because that's the coolest thing ever I so would have loved to have had a piece of pizza that day any day out there so let's talk about that that's all I really had to eat is my emergency rations and the fish that I caught it was pretty slim pickings uh, there wasn't a lot of greenery to be eaten where I was um, there were some wild onions that I dug up a uh, little bit of plantain a little bit of yarrow you're coming into fall and winter and there's just not anything I didn't find maybe five rose hips there was no other berries that I found I did find a ton of chaga I climbed way up into the ridge the very top and that's where I found the big giant ancient birch trees and I found some really good um, bunch of chaga so I had chaga nearly every day Oh, and I've got to tell you about this. This became like my Wilson. I ended up finding a water bottle on like day two or three on the edge of the river. Who knows where it came from, but I didn't care. I was so excited to have a water bottle. I carved out a stopper and I took some leather off of my ax sheath and used the all of my Leatherman to put a hole through it and it perfectly fit. And then that way, I could carry it and I would take this with me everywhere I went um, on all my explorations and climbing the ridge it was so amazing to have a water bottle so that worked out so so good and if you cinch it up then it doesn't pull out when you carry it so that was my massive um, trash find which uh, I'll never forget this water bottle. That was awesome. So every day I would get up and I would fill up my pot, put it on the fire, and I would, I always had chaga in it, and I would fill that up for the day and, and boil it, and then I would put it back in the river to cool down, and then I would pour it into my bottle. So every day I was just drinking chaga every day, and that's, that's all I drank. Now let's talk about ticks for a minute. You were supposed to get another shot for that tick encephalitis in the field and I I knew right away I was like man I do not want this shot there is no way I want this shot while I'm out in the field it's gonna be hard enough already and I don't remember what day it was that they came out and said okay it's time for the second round of shots and I said I don't want it I do not want it I don't want to be sick I haven't seen any ticks so far and it was on like one of the med checks when they came out the very next day, I had a tick on me, and it was biting me. I was like, son of a gun. You know, tick-borne encephalitis, that's a freaky thing to think about. Uh, I removed that tick, and what we were supposed to do is put them in baggies and keep them just in case they needed to be analyzed later. Well, I ended up taking, like, many, many ticks off of me over the course of the next whatever, how many days I was there. And it had one bite me on the back of the neck, which then... Um, and it made one of my lymph nodes in the back of my neck get really big. Um, so I was really freaked out thinking, you know, I've got tick-borne encephalitis or whatever's going to happen to me. Uh, I got, by then I was out. And before I left Mongolia, I had to get checked out by a doctor to get cleared to go. And then they administered the second dose of that shot to me at that point which didn't make me sick which I was really glad but here I had this very large enlarged lymph node that I was pretty freaked out about 
So we took those ticks that had been, uh, that had bit me, production had saved them, we sent them in to get tested and thank goodness, they were free of any kind of disease. But yeah, that, that freaked me out to have that, that enlarged lymph node didn't leave me for several months after. And um, yeah, that was, going to a foreign country and dealing with something like that is kind of kind of freaky. Um, let's talk about weight loss for a minute and why I left. Uh, season four, I ended up losing 28 pounds, which put me down to about 97 pounds. I was going to get pulled on season four the day I left. Uh, they were going to pull me. And you might not know that, but that wasn't really clear in season four, but I was at my weight limit for weight loss. So we had to go. Season, so in 49 days, I lost 28 pounds. Now in season five, by day 28 when I left, I had lost 19 pounds. So I was losing weight at a much, much faster rate than season four for I don't know what reason. And if you think maybe the timeline had something to do with it, I was coming from season four to season five in nine months. So very quick turnaround for my body to be processing another starvation event, which you really can't avoid on this show. I don't think you can avoid getting into that point. Uh, you can debate this all you want about this is just a starvation show. Well, it's just a matter of fact that you're going to lose a lot of weight and you're going to have to find ways to deal with it. And there's not really a lot of ways to deal with it. Living off the land is extremely hard. It's harder than you may think. You need those sugars. You need those complex carbohydrates. It's really hard to find and duplicate in nature in the fall. So you're really at a disadvantage with your limited tools and gear. By day 28, um, the loneliness was sinking in. The green tarp glow was driving me crazy. And I just felt like I was going to be spending more and more time in the shelter. I was just dreading it. Absolutely dreading just sitting for hours in that shelter with the smoke and the green glow. It was literally getting to me. And the weight loss was happening so much quicker on season five. I figured I had maybe four or five more days I'd be at my weight limit. Um, I had no reason to stay. I had built a great shelter. I had fished and found all the food I could. I kept myself busy cutting firewood and, and just keeping busy, keeping sane. I, I had nothing left to prove and I was just I was just ready to be done. I was ready to see family and eat some food and have a conversation. You know, when the, when the crew would come out and do these med checks and, and swap your media, they specifically try not to engage you in conversation and to keep it as authentic as possible. And it's just heartbreaking when they leave. You want to talk. You want to share all these things that you're doing and all what you've been through and what you're experiencing and they're just like, well, see you later. Bye. I gotta go. And it's just, and you know, the thing is they, they, they send you a message on the yellow brick. Hey, heads up, stay around camp. We're coming in today. And like, it's such a big deal all day. You're like, Oh, cool. You know, you got something to look forward to. These people are going to come in and it's people, you know, you've, you've become um, friends with, you have a relationship with these crew members. And it's really, it's really a cool thing to see them. And then they leave and, and your heart breaks. It's back to just like, uh, it's silent again and you're alone again. It comes and goes so quickly and you don't know when they're coming. Is it going to be a week? Is it going to be two weeks? When are you going to see a human again? Oh, it's, it's a lot to take in and, and, only nine months previous, I'd already, I'd already done this. I'd already been there. So it really weighs on your mind. And your mind can just eat you alive. This, this alone thing, the psychology of it is the big deal. And how much can you adapt? Alone is about how can you adapt? You know, you need to have skills but you need to be adaptable. K 
can you adapt to your circumstances? Can you adapt to the situation? Can you adapt with the materials at hand? Can you adapt to your mindset and your physical body changing? That's what it is all about. You can be a fairly uh, unskilled person, I think. And as long as you are creative and can adapt, you're going to be fine. I think that's why people in real survival situations, some of them do quite well because they have to. And if they are adaptable, they can pull it off. So going into this challenge, if you're thinking about wanting to be on the show, yeah, you, you absolutely should have skills, but you need to be adaptable. And the other advice I would give you is you need to get out there and spend some big time time alone. More than a weekend, you know, but if that's all you got, that's, that's start with that, but go someplace remote and put yourself out there for a couple days and see what that feels like to be completely removed and by yourself and think of it long term like okay you you know it's only going to be a day or two but what would it feel like to be out here for weeks on end with nobody and no input and no piece of paper to to write things on and no books to read there's no input all you have is what you can adapt to what can you come up with what can you procure for food what it's all about adaptability and how can you keep your mind together and that's that's why this show is fascinating because everyone responds to it differently you know some of these early tappers get a lot of flack but honestly you just do not know how you're going to respond to that situation until you're in it so go out and try it go out and see how you would react to that definite definite loneliness, that, that absolute um, separation from anyone else in any input. It, it's, it's pretty difficult at times, and other times it's absolutely exhilarating. As far as animals, uh, I never got, I, I, I saw just a handful of grouse and they had some big grouse there, and boy, were they skittish. They were pure black. The really big ones were just huge, and they were pure black. And uh, wow, they were super, super skittish. I saw a few of those who never could get close. And then the regular grouse, you know, like you're, you're familiar with seeing here in North America. It stalked one one day with the bow, and just couldn't get a shot off. It just kept getting ahead of me and far enough that I couldn't get a shot. And then I saw a couple more climbing the ridge one day and I didn't have my bow with me. But then the only other thing I actually took a shot at was a squirrel. And it was on my very last, the day before I tapped, there was a squirrel in camp. First squirrel I'd seen. It was sitting right, right in a tree above my shelter. And I just, I looked at it and I said, do you know I can eat you? <laughs> of course, I have to shoot it first. And and it just wouldn't move. So I got my bow and oh, I just I just missed it by that far. I hit I hit the trunk of the tree and it but it stayed there. I ended up getting like three shots off on it, but I just missed. It was up there and you're shooting up high. And uh, I missed. I did retrieve two out of my three arrows. One of them is out there and I always think, oh man, centuries later, or who's ever going to find this arrow is going to wonder what in the heck, where did this come from, you know? But that's the only animal I ever got to shoot at. I never saw the boars. I never saw a wolf. I never saw a deer or the red deer, which are like the elk here. And I heard them all the time. I heard the deer. I heard the, uh, the red deer, which are like the elk. I heard the wolves all the time. I had stuff come to my shelter and get really close all the time at night, of course, at night. And I would go, bah, 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 bah. hey, hey, get out of here. You know, I'd like hit the side of my tarp. Cause you're laying there, you don't know what's out there. After a while, that just doesn't bug you anymore. It's just like, bam, 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 you know, hit this and you hear it run off, whatever it is. <laughs> I'll go back to sleep. Those are just, you know, it's just some of the stuff you got to deal with when you're alone. But once you're out there, you get acclimatized to it and it really doesn't bother you anymore. But 
didn't see much wildlife, definitely not much to hunt. Um, I just saw signs of it. I'd see the signs of the wild boar. It was all, you know, areas all tore up, but I just, I never saw any. So the hunting just didn't pan out for me. Would I have chose something else? Hindsight, other than the bow? Yes, a white tarp. <laughs> I, would have I would have taken a white tarp to save my sanity because the bow was, uh, it didn't work out. But yeah, 28 days was enough for me. And I was very satisfied with my journey. I was so, I feel so blessed to have been able to go hang out with all of the other cast and wonderful crew. It was an amazing experience. Mongolia was, the, the Mongolian people are just very, very fun. And I made some good friends. Amazing experience. So I'm sure there's something I forgot. Ooh, ooh, let me show you some of my souvenirs. I still haven't got this framed yet, but I got this really beautiful painting. Look at that. Isn't that neat? You know, the countryside, it looked just like that. I mean, there was no trees in uh, Ulaanbaatar, and for many miles we, we traveled like, you know, eight hours into the bush on these jeep trails to get to our drop-off location and uh but other than that there was just plains and it, you know gurs all over and and grazing animals and mongolia is just i think they said there's like 16 uh animals for every one mongolian so before and after uh launch we got a lot of meat. We ate a lot of meat, which was really good. And uh, they like their meat over there. So they're, uh, the grazing animals are just like everywhere. They're in the towns, they're on the streets. And I think you may have seen that in my video with the pre-launch, but uh, very interesting. And they just don't even slow down from it. They just kind of reep, reep, reep. <laughs> the animals take off off the road, but they're like even in the towns, there's cows and horses and sheep and goats and stuff just wandering everywhere. It was pretty cool. Um, Mongolia, this is like some uh, Mongolian script here. This is their traditional um, script and this means love, which I just thought was pretty cool. I ended up buying a couple of these. These are like these little uh, fortune teller games. It's just a little leather pouch and there's the, uh, you, you roll, you roll bones. So there's bones in here. These are the bones and you roll them and however they, they land, either they're up or down or whatnot, then you look on the sheet and figure out the code and it'll tell you your fortune. For instance, like uh, one will come or come back soon or everlasting luck or without any success, try well <laughs> or try hard or the best fortune is on you or you will hear good news. <laughs> it's just it's just kind of a fun, fun game. So these are like knuckles of sheep or something. So guys, I want to give one of these away to you. I'm going, to, I'm going to send somebody this. This came straight from Mongolia. And what I want you to do is tell me, give this video a thumbs up and tell me what your favorite part of season five was. And I'll be drawing a winner for this little this little bag, this little fortune teller bag, which I think is is pretty cool. The other thing Mongolia is known for is cashmere. So I got this really cool sweater and I bought a cashmere sweater dress. That is so pretty and I haven't even worn it yet because I have no boots to go with it. I, I don't have shoes, guys. I don't have stuff to, to look good. But anyway, I'm gonna wear that cashmere dress soon. It looks, it's pretty cool. The blanket. The fun thing I had is when we got to Ulaanbaatar, uh, there was so much Asian candy, but not only Asian candy, because it's so close to Russia, there was just so much of this like Russian candy to try. So I just, I brought home just tons of candy that I had no idea what it was. And we all just chowed on it for a long time. I brought home a lot of Asian candy. 
was just, it was pretty cool to be there. Uh, one of the questions I've, I've had often in season four and season five is, oh, what, what was the first meal you got when, when you got back? Well, the fact is you have to really slowly re reintroduce your, your body to food. So getting food immediately is, is, uh, it's very slow and, it, and it's got to be that way because you, you just can't process food. You're, you're definitely in starvation mode. So you get broth and maybe a cracker and it's just slowly, slowly, slowly works its way up from there. I definitely felt the effects of starvation more in season four. I was way far gone by then. And this year, the season five, I just didn't want to put my body that far, that far back. It had been too recent that I had already done that. So 19 pounds this time got me down to 104 pounds and it was enough. And it takes a couple weeks to just even get back to eating normal. You get heartburn and you just don't feel good. You just, it's, it's a rough road at first. So you got to take it really slow. I, I climbed the ridge three times in my stay there. I, I just could not stay still. When it was too hot, I was still, but otherwise I was out exploring, looking for better places to fish and climbing that ridge. And it was just stunning up there. I did, that was my happy place. I just wanted to be up high on the ridge and see those views. And that's where I found the chaga and I would watch the golden eagles fly in the thermals. It was absolutely amazing. I was so happy there. Um, it didn't really come across on the show how happy I was, how satisfied and content I was, but I was really joyous there. And you know, if you watched season four, you saw the commercial I did. I did another commercial in season five that they never aired. It was just kind of a cute, quirky little thing about Tansy Fresh being like a deodorant. But anyways, yeah, doesn't matter to you. You never saw the commercial. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining me. And if you're still here, wow, good job. <laughs> you have the endurance to survive alone season six or seven or eight. Put your name in and give it a shot. But in the meantime, thanks for joining me. Leave your comments below. Win the Mongolia goodie bag. Thanks for watching. This is Girl in the Woods. She gone. Oh, and don't forget to get outside and get happy.